Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, really excited to have you here today um, on the first of the Our Regenerative Future uh, series, speaking with experts, scientists, farmers, and other advocates for regenerative agriculture in New Zealand. Um, this has been a, a wonderful uh, series to dive deep into over the last few months. Um, I've sp been speaking with a lot of different people from across the sector, um, and it's been a real eye-opener for me um, just to see um, how many passionate people are out there experimenting with regenerative agriculture and seeing some great results. This started, um, I guess, as an idea to tell the stories of some of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship fellows that were involved in regenerative agriculture last year. Um, and then we um, discovered that Pure Advantage were actually looking to uh, look at soil sub, uh, carbon sequestration from a, a regenerative agriculture lens and um, interested in looking at other models of regenerative um, practices. And so we got chatting with them. Um, there's a lot of aligned um, values between the two organizations in terms of um, innovation, um, uh, sort of tinkering with ideas on the edges, and really um, this idea of New Zealand being a leader for the world. Um, so really excited to partner with them and then uh, get into the research. So I've been chatting with people from about December onwards, and the more people I talked to, the more came out of the woodwork. Um, and uh, yeah, really just so many people. So we're gonna be introducing uh, three of those contributors to you today. Um, they, they are the ones who are on the ground involved in regenerative agriculture. Uh, my role has really been as the storyteller, um, hearing from the people that are involved and then translating their stories into something that could be engaging and serve as a, as a catalyst to, um, to unite this sector and provide some momentum going forward. So we're really excited with how this series has been received so far. Um, you'll see that Paula is putting up a poll. Uh, we'd love to just know a little bit about who's on the call um, to help us orient the questions. Um, so please do answer those three questions. They're very short questions. Um, also, you'll see in the bottom, there's a Q&A box. Um, that is where you can send through some questions. Now we have had some sent ahead of time and so I'll be including those as well. But if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. That is the little um, box in the bottom bar on the right hand side and we will be answering those questions for you. So I'm seeing people uh, voting in, in the poll. That's fantastic. And also you can upvote questions. So if you're looking at the Q&A box and you see a question that um, you resonate with or that you would also like an answer to, you can upvote that questions and that'll help us just to manage um, some of the questions that are coming through and assure that the ones that are on people's minds are the ones that we are answering. Uh, we've got 208 people on this call currently, so um, if I, we don't get to your question, I do apologize. We are running six of these sessions, so this is just the first one. Okay, I'll give people another 30 seconds or so just to um, engage in that poll. It's looking like we have a pretty even spread at this point of, um, of people from a farming background, from science and academia, a few more from business and media and then a bunch of people who are in sort of the other or general interest categories. Um, great to see that um, people have uh, read some of the stories and most people are at least very or somewhat familiar with regenerative agriculture, which is a wonderful place for us to be starting today. Okay, I think we're going to crack into it uh, proper now. So again, my name is Alina Siegfried. I am a storyteller, and so today I'll be trying to tease out some of the stories of the, of the people involved in our regenerative future. I'm gonna let our panelists introduce themselves. Um, so let's start uh, with you, Alan. Over to you. And, and viewers, my name's Alan Richardson, Sonia, and I are organic sheep and beef farmers. We've been doing it for about 23 years. We live about an hour and a half inland from Dunedin, the South Island of New Zealand. And it's a beautiful part of the country. You can see a, a view of some of our farmland behind you on my screen. 
for me, or, um, I want to talk a wee bit about organics because that's part of my journey, a big part of my journey. We were one of the first to get into organics in New Zealand, not the first, but early adopters. And there's a fair bit of, uh, a lot of distrust with people that um, were doing that. And um, especially from other farmers. And, you know, it, was, it took a long time to earn respect for what we were doing. Organics for me was a word that I didn't even know about until I went to a leadership course. And two or three of the speakers were, were talking about this great potential for the marketing side of organics, this great market. That excited me and I studied it and uh, won a, a farming scholarship to study overseas and did that for six months. And that really got Sonia and I going on organics and, and we started converting um, certification so that's the first part of the journey journey the second part probably was um, my father was a very successful venture farmer and a lot of strain on that relationship because for him it was like turning the clock backwards so that's another aspect which um, has has driven me I suppose from the, the regenerative side, um, a good friend, a farming friend of mine, Hamish Belsky, first put me into that arena, I suppose, by saying, have a look at some of these podcasts. And let's say, you know, the podcast was, so, here. For me, it was, um, it was like an awakening. Some of the, the people from overseas, especially that I, that I listened to. And uh, for me, it was really the missing link for organics. Um, some of the things that we couldn't do well in organics, obviously it's both cheap from a, a regenerative point of view, and that for me is really exciting. And, um, you know, just now at 57, I've never been more excited about farming than I am now, because I can see this the regenerative side and the organic working really well together and um, and achieving all the things that, that I set out to achieve and more. So um, it's a good place to be. Um, regenerative is starting to gain momentum in New Zealand. And there's a lot of, a lot of people asking questions about the farms, touching the wet paint. They want to get in there and, and try a wee bit. And for me, regenerative, the, the key thing for regenerative is that anyone can get on, on the regenerative bus wherever they like. It attracts people from both organic right through to the high input people, high input farmers, and they can all have a go. Um, but you, they're not bound by restrictions or standards or whatever. And that for me is the key. If we can get as many people trying a wee bit of regenerative, that will only increase and they'll become even uh, more, more keen on the idea. And, and I think we've got a real industry brewing. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you, Alan. Um, we're having a little bit of sound issues from you uh, breaking up periodically. Um, okay. I'm, I'm wondering if we might be able to fix it just by turning your video off to, to improve the, the audio connection. So the, it'll be sad to lose your video, but I think we'll try that and see if we, we just get some better sound quality. Um, wonderful. Thank okay. you for that introduction, Alan. Um, let's go uh, over to you now, Sarah Saylor, if you would like to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone, um, and thank you, um, Alina and Simon, for organizing this, and also uh, to my uh, fellow panelists. It's really nice to be here. I'm hoping that the sound will work out fine. Um, just keep going and see how things are going. Um, just a little bit, uh, a little bit about myself. So um, I'm, uh, I'm, I work for, I'm based in Auckland, and I work for a uh, an advisory and project development company called Barstrat. So um, all of our focus is in the um, market-based solutions for terrestrial and marine um, problems. Uh, but we're also working quite a bit in the impact investment space on the basis that we recognize that for the transformation and the change that is required. Um, at the scale that is required, we have to think how we're going to bridge the resources that are available to date, including from government, 
uh, with more uh, private investment potentially to be able to do, you know, to pursue this transition and the transformation that we need. And I think um, Alan already kind of set up the, what the context is in terms of on farm. Um, a little bit more uh, about myself. So I have an environmental management background. So in some ways I feel that, you know, I am the, 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 the one in the room with that professional background that kind of carried me into the regenerative agriculture space. Um, but I, I originally come from Romania. So as a, I grew up um, in a small village outside of Bucharest. And, you know, I grew up with my grandparents having um, their own, you know, subsistence agriculture and so on. So you have that, um, you know, I, I have that exposure to nature and the environment in which our food comes from, from a very early age. And I find quite useful that this is the sort of stuff that you carry through life and influences your, you know, our personal interests, but also passion for cer certain topics. Um, in, in my case, I've been in New Zealand for about 15 years and I worked in research for about a decade um, at Lanka Research, leading the sustainable business area. And interestingly enough, when I meet, moved to New Zealand in 2005, many of you, especially uh, those that are in farming, but not only, you remember the entire uh, threat around food miles. So New Zealand exporters at the time were really facing this big challenge, uh, especially coming out of the UK, um, linked to food miles and the perception that products, and, and specifically food products, being shipped all the way from New Zealand, um, they may be, you know, producing, contributing a, a greater um, impact to the environment. So we're in a big rush at the time because of this trade uh, challenge to find solutions. So we've got all in terms of post business, exporters, the government, academia, we got into the entire space of life cycle assessment and try to bring carbon assessments and carbon footprints onto almost as a business tool to be able to answer this threat, right? Things are passed on. We are here now 15 years later and, you know, programs like uh, Environmark, um, now currently it's, its new brand name is Toy2, have emerged out of this um, market pressure if you want. And in the meantime, you know, we shifted from a major focus on carbon onto water quality um, issues in New Zealand context. And we've got biodiversity loss cha um, challenges and we've got, you know, health issues and so on. So you can just see how, you know, um, we are kind of going, waving, going from one type of pressure to another. And we're trying to address all of these issues often in an unconnected sort of silo way because of policy issues, because of resourcing issues, because of the way we are used, in fact, to, to address issues um, separately. And so that kind of takes me to what is the attraction with regenerative, is the fact that here it is a concept that not only, um, you know, it is easy to grasp for a lot of people, but it also has the potential of bringing all of these concerns and issues together. And so, I, in a lot of ways, I feel that this is the reason why we're seeing seeing right now such a uh, such an interest in New Zealand context in regenerative, and such an energy, such a movement that is being built up. I think the challenge for not for us right now is really how do we transform a movement, a passion for something, into a very tactical, strategic transition pathway, which is also commercially viable because. The challenges that we've got in terms of land use, and I'll just very briefly touch on that, is that really for a lot of farmers and landowners to be able to embrace and, and um, join the journey, if you want, of regenerative agriculture and embracing regenerative practices, there is this question, question of, you know, how can we make it viable, you know? And viability, it's all about context. It's about including, you know, family and farmer context. It's about the cap capacity that is available on, on farms and along the value chain, capacity to even you know, be, be a player and be able to be active in different value chains where you can capture different types of value. So all of these things, you know, kind of for me, coming at things from an environmental management perspective, brings us back to the ground to say, we cannot answer environmental or health issues without actually bringing uh, commercial viability, market access, and so on together. Um, and linked to that, uh, just very briefly, because I know that um, Gary is going to cover that quite well, is of course the, the synergy between regenerative agriculture and regenerative transformation proposition more broadly, and how we can actually leverage 
the practice, the experience, the certification system that we've got in place and strengthening because of the organic bill that is coming up. And so I, I feel again that if we talk about, you know, food and trade and being competitive, we've got to kind of merge, you know, really leverage what the organics sector has learned and have put in place in terms of systems and expand that through the regenerative lenses. I think that would be all for me for now. Wonderful. Yes, uh, great points there around a, a holistic view and taking a whole systems approach to, to some of these challenges. Um, I'd love to pass it over to Gary now, please, for your introduction. Thanks. Hi, Alina. Nice to see you and nice to see my friend Teresella also. Good to meet you, Alan. Um, talking to you from the East Coast in New Hampshire, so it's my night. You all are, as usual, ahead of me. It's tomorrow for, for you. Um, I began my organic journey actually as a climate scientist back in the 1970s, studying dendroclimatology, looking at evidence of climate change um, as uh, uh, made evident by tree rings, looking at uh, tree rings at Arctic and Alpine regions. And um, it wasn't too, I wasn't too deep into that science before I realized that I'd much rather work on the solution side of the equation. And uh, early in my career, uh, I, probably with some of the same influences as Alan encountered, I um, uh, discovered that uh, organic farming practices are basically another word for carbon sequestering practices and that without sequestering, we're not ever going to slow down climate change, let alone reverse it. And putting it more positively, um, carbon sequestration holds one of the real keys, I think, to uh, getting out of this mess. So um, I began then working at an ecological research institute on organic research, studying productivity, uh, horticulture, animal, uh, ag, uh, uh, grains, uh, vegetables, uh, in, um, aquaculture, and uh, then Ronald Reagan came into government and uh, to the, became the president in early 80s. Um, and slashed all funding for organic and renewable energy research, everything that my institute was doing. So I was on the board of a little organic farming school, uh, eating my partner who had his one cow, uh, the, the, the founder of the school, eating his delicious yogurt every day. And we decided to start selling the yogurt um, to uh, make up for the lack of federal funding. This is 1983. Well, that became Stonyfield farm the world's largest organic yogurt company with roughly 400 million US in turnover. It became my life's work really for the last uh, 36 years. And of course, in that transact, um, not only could, was there no way to put the words organic and industry together at the same time back then, but today it's become a, 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 the growth sector, whether it's personal care products or food and beverage, um, Organic is now uh, closing on a $60 billion of commerce here in the US. And, um, you know, along the way in the, in the intervening 30 plus years, I've managed to sit on many, many boards in many, many sectors from wine and beer to feed and grain and candy and uh, flour products and baked goods and home meal replacements and so on. And um, uh, this is all a long way of saying that uh, 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 the, the for me, it's always been exactly what Chirisella just talked about. It's always been, we the science was proven to me early on, and it's always been about um, proving the marketability and the market proposition. And so, just to leapfrog to what we're talking about today, um, one of my early friends in this world is the fellow who coined the name. Uh, regenerative, Bob Rodale, who was actually my first funder at my Ecological Research Institute back in the 70s. And Bob and I used to have these long walks in his farm, uh, where today now we have 35 years of side-by-side of, um, -side trials looking at organic versus conventional corn production. And uh, Bob was arguing for the need for this new term, regenerative, back then. And I was arguing fiercely that the last thing we need is another standard. And so I took a great interest in the emergence a couple of years ago 
of the uh, so-called regenerative organic standard that has gotten some um, headway here in the U.S. And I'll I'll just uh, because I want to get I know Alina we want to get into the Q and A. I'll just simply say two things here. Um, for me, there is no such thing as regenerative without organic. Uh, and in fact, the U.S. standard for regenerative requires that you first be certified organic. Um, I understand the distinction. I understand some of the focuses, but I will say, um, as you know, Alina, so I'll just make it public. I, I disagree with uh, your, the, one of the opening paragraphs in your introduction. I don't believe that organic is merely about reducing harm. And, um, and I debated that with Bob uh, back in the day. And I don't believe that, um, in fact, I see re organic regenerative as being all about restorative. Uh, and, and I'll just say Stonyfield uh, buys our milk from over 2,000 family farmers. Uh, the average herd size uh, is 65 cows. Um, of course, we buy millions of pounds of fruit and flavorings and all the other companies I'm involved with. Uh, uh, you know, it's all about supply chain. And I, I have endless, endless data points and examples from great farmers like Alan who have taught me that um, or regenerative organic is, is about water conservation, is about biodiversity, is about soil carbon, is about farmer income, is about animal welfare, is about humane treatment, and, and also worker rights. And so to me, uh, this, I'm, I'm thrilled. I agree with you, Chair Zella. There's a whole excitement about this, but perhaps during the course of our hour, we'll talk about some recent consumer research in the US that really shows that uh, uh, most consumers uh, are still trying to understand what organic is and aren't yet uh, making the pivot here. But they understand the principles, and particularly during this COVID crisis, there's incredible economic uh, tailwinds now supporting all of this that I, I'm sure we can talk about. Mm, thank you for, uh, for raising that, Gary. And certainly there's been some magnificent work by the organic sector here in New Zealand that this, this newer terminology and this newer movement, um, if it is indeed a new movement, um, can build upon. Um, so I'd love to uh, crack into some of the questions there. Um, we've we've had quite a number coming uh, coming through in the in the Q and A box. So just a reminder that that's the place to put them if you have questions. Um, let's start with um, well, let's let's start with where we're at really, in, in terms of this, uh, this is a post COVID world that we're at right now. So. Um, have, have any of you got any comments around um, how, I guess, the, uh, the regenerative agriculture movement or industry um, has changed or will change or has an opportunity to change uh, given the situation that we find ourselves in now? Yeah, let me, let me quickly just uh, maybe tag on to my last comment and go right at that. Um, so uh, here in the US, I chair something called Organic Voices, which is a co consortium of the leading probably three quarters of the 60 plus billion dollars in sales. The, the, those are the brands that are in it. And um, when, we, when the crisis first broke here, and uh, most of us were, let's say, 75% retail and 20% uh, food service and very little um, direct to consumer, very little e-commerce as a sector. Um, that has just been completely changed. Obviously, the food service sector is gone right now. Uh, restaurants are not open here in the States. Um, but the 142 million consumers who buy organic, uh, we, we, we break ourselves into two markets here. We have what we call devoteds, who 89 million U.S. adults who purchase more than three organic products each week. And then we have temperates, which is 53 million. Uh, they use organic, three organic products or so per month. Uh, that number has uh, skyrocketed during COVID. Um, and and, and uh, to put it in very concrete terms, Stonyfield sells to about 1.5 million core mothers who see themselves as a subset of um, uh, 26 million moms who describe themselves as wellness moms. Well, our, we cannot keep up with demand right now. Our 1.5 million has swelled to somewhere between 2.8 and 3 million, nearly doubled. And this is true across every, from little tiny broth companies to massive rice growth producers here. 
And what's happened very simply is consumers uh, have taken matters into their own hands. They are uh, absolutely understanding. Uh, in, in, as in, 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 I've never seen a step change like this in my 40 years that we are what we eat. Uh, we are what we wear on our bodies. We are what we smell in our, on our uh, uh, personal care products. And uh, that um, it, the number one way to stay healthy and keep your family healthy is to avoid un unnecessary exposure to toxins. Um, we have data here that one in two Americans in the U.S. are going to be, get cancer in our lifetimes, and that's due to inadvertent exposure to toxins every day. So our issue right now, Alina, just to sort of sum, hit a uh, summary point, is more of supply than demand. And uh, when you drill into it and get into some of these consumer attitudes, you can see that uh, people get that this is preventative health care. But more importantly, they get that they want to know, they want companies they can trust. Uh, and although there's enormous financial insecurity here, we now have 20, uh, 31 million Americans, new, new additions to the unemployment rolls. Uh, nonetheless, uh, organic across every single sector is, uh, we, initially we couldn't even keep in stock. Now we're finally uh, catching up. But, what, but for sure what's happening is that people have discovered how much organic they can get at home. So I would just bring this home to, to us here in New Zealand by saying simply, the market opportunity has just exploded. Uh, this excitement with the, the new organic bill that Chiricella mentioned, and uh, all of uh, Alan's uh, uh, many, many colleagues who followed in his footsteps, uh, and, and my organic uh, entrepreneurship center that I'm building uh, uh, just south of Mochueca in Natamoti, uh, is I think perfectly well timed because I, while while many many consumers might drop back to other practices uh, earlier practices they have discovered that the goodness that is organic the quality they've discovered bulk organic we sell mostly large size containers uh, organic carrots in bulk organic rice in bulk they're finding that it's economical they're finding that they can get it direct at home so they can avoid some of that retail margin. And as a result, um, I believe, like I said before, we've got enormous tailwinds that are going to carry us, jettison the market into the future. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alan's big, talking big... he's muted. Ah, right, yes. Um, and Alan, perhaps to avoid the sound issues, if you could try to turn your video off while you're talking, you can do that in the bottom left-hand corner. Look, um, I'll back up what Gary's saying, that there's been a whole lot of um, food scares throughout the world over the last 30 or 40 years, mad cow, all these sort of things. What we've seen every time after a food scare, there's been a big spike in organic food demand. And, and, and what we're seeing just now is just um, reaffirming that. So people are going to what they trust, and um, organic is a brand that, that people trust. Whether regenerative becomes a brand in the future and people trust, that is yet to be uh, decided. Right, so really big opportunity for New Zealand here. Uh, we do okay, face the problem. I, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Can I just uh, quickly make a point? Uh, conventional, you may be reading over there that conventional milk in uh, the U.S. is being dumped right now. Uh, large, num large percentages. And the reason for that is that so-called cheaper milk, and of course we all know cheap food is not really cheap, and no one knows this better than Terracella. Uh, you know, there's, you, there's externalized costs that we don't pay at the cash register. But what's happened is that cheap milk found its way mostly to food service. So to restaurants, to schools, and those places are closed. And right now organic farmers uh, are being asked to, you know, increase herd size and increase costs. So it's, a, it's literally it's what Alan just said is, is actually happening at the moment. That's a very interesting point. Uh, Tira Saylor, did you have something you wanted to add there? Well, just focusing a little bit more on, uh, let's say, the, the New Zealand context right now. And like Alan said, and also what we observe in the US, yes, there is this increased uh, demand if we want, if you want, right? That's been the case already in New Zealand. The, the challenge, though, for New Zealand, for us working in, in this sphere of, you know, restorative, regenerative, organic, whatever, the spectrum of um, the spectrum of environmental 
the performance systems of food production remains the same. And that is how we are actually going to respond to the, to the opportunity, to the demand, how we're going to uh, scale up, how we can bring more people to you know, measure up in the first place. Because um, at the end of the day, what we see on the ground, if you want, in the country is that we have you know, really a lot of landowners that are doing fantastic, brilliant things that are driven often by what they believe in, right? And so to kind of match that with what the market wants and so on, then we have to bring in the systems, we have to bring in the measurement and, and so on. And that's a part where we've, you know, we kind of go in first, you know, we've had a, a carbon threat. We responded to that 15 years ago. We came out with a product and so on, took advantage of the market, you know, the first zero carbon wines in the world and that sort of stuff. Um, the question right now for us is really, you know, if the opportunity is there, how can we leverage, you know, how can we transform an interest in regenerative agriculture into a market opportunity that really goes beyond the passion that we see on, on those that own the land and do things differently. Um, and, you know, that is still a challenge for us. Yes. Can I, can I just say, sorry, Lena, because uh, Alan was there. And, and Terracella knows my feelings on this. What happened in the US, if it's any example, is where we went from being a movement to an industry was when we had a national standard. When all mm -hmm. of a sudden there was a there there with a set of laws at most, most fundamentally enforcement, uh, penalties if you did not comply. And this is, this is the challenge right now with um, uh, regenerative. There's no body of law around it. Okay, so we've, we've got a question actually that um, I think follows on very nicely from that. We've had, we have a historical problem in New Zealand that most of our farmers produce uh, raw materials or commodities, and they don't generally have that connection with the end, um, end food product market. So um, how might we, I guess, suggest a market visibility of regeneratively grown foods in New Zealand um, and so that more value goes back to the producer. And I'd love to invite um, Chair Saylor to uh, respond because I, I know you've, you've done a bit of work in this area. Uh, I mean, really there are different, there are different pathways. Uh, and I was saying, this is what I was trying to say at, at the start, that in terms of where we, we start, we really have to understand context, you know, uh, and we have to work with what those in the, in the business, whether they are, you know, farm landowners or a um, manufacturer of, of food products or, or health products and so on where they are at um, and start from there. One of the things that I believe this COVID crisis is actually highlighting uh, as an opportunity is the fact that we may in fact try and capture much more of value in our local market and around local food economy. Um, because the, the challenge in the absence of a standard, which is what Gary is talking about, it's very difficult to go to an expo market and actually make the case for a regenerative product. We simply don't have uh, at this point in time, the systems that will clearly differentiate. We do have organic certification. And once again, you know, I would encourage very strongly that we are, we are tactical when it comes to this. We have to embrace that as a way of actually leveraging an organic certification standard and the systems that go with it, that we have them in place in New Zealand and build to achieve, um, you know, regenerative. But in the meantime, there is the opportunity of actually thinking much more around testing concepts that have to do with local food economy. Um, I mean, we talked, you know, Alina, you asked, you know, what is it that we observed through the COVID crisis? And we know that demand for organic, even in New Zealand, has increased. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the spikes before. Um, the question now is, can we actually hold on to it? Because we know that in addition to a safe product, which is what organic often is about, you know, association with a health um, spray-free, uh, chemical-free product, it is also the interest that New Zealanders and all of us have in supporting our local businesses, in supporting our local farmers. Uh, and so, you know, local food economy is the type of work that we've done in Rotorua, uh, presents an opportunity, almost like a bridging step. You know, not everyone is going to be able to capture that export market right away unless they go through the loops and hoops of certification um, that we know we still lack capability to do it at scale and, you know, do it efficiently. Um, efficiently let's say but we can look at you know local food economies as a as an alternative um, 
of capturing value and recognizing or building that brand around regenerative um, and locally produced food. Right, Ellen, I know that there are uh, quite a number of regenerative um, farmers down where you are in uh, South Otago. Um, are you able to speak to any um, local food uh, networks that have been developing around there or is that, is that still a, a, a large gap? It is still a large gap, Alina, and, um, and I think we're, we're still at the stage where we're discovering regenerative farming and trying to join all the dots. And, and the marketing side, the pathway to the marketing hasn't, you know, we haven't joined those dots yet. Um, from my, my point of view that I'd much rather see we get a lot of farmers on board exper experiencing and uh, experimenting with regenerative and, and being successful with that. Then when you get some critical mass, then we've actually got something to go to the market with. And, and that's been the real problem with organics in New Zealand. We haven't had the critical mass. And um, without that critical mass, you, you can't chase a market. So um, let's, um, let's get the people on the ground, get them going successful, and, and then we've got a product to take to market. Got it. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned marketing there, and there's another question that's come through, which I think is really interesting, from Rachel Monks. Um, what's the most compelling aspect of regenerative farming from a storytelling to consumer point of view? So how do we actually talk about this in a way that gets people excited? Um, look, um, I, I can make a start on that. Look, um, just seeing healthy animals walking through multi-species pastures, sunflowers, you name it, it's, it's such a wonderful thing. And if, it, if you ever want to see an animal in a natural place, take them to an, a regenerative farm that's doing things well, and you'll see happy animals and plants, um, the microbes, the, the whole thing, everything is there. And it's just see the excitement on the farmer's face and his family and, and everything, everything else involved in that. You, and you'll, you'll see why people are excited about regenerative. I, yeah, I, would I, only, oh, go ahead. I would only add to that perhaps, um, I, mean, I think it's quite powerful in terms of market messaging, the entire carbon positioning side of things. And in fact, we do know that a lot of farmers are interested in this because of the carbon sequestration potential. Um, and so that provides for some messaging, perhaps not directly with consumers. I don't know, Gary may want to add more to that, but definitely in terms of uh, supply chain and you know, requirements from a, from a customer client, if you want perspective in the market. Um, the carbon story is very powerful because of the entire you know, climate situation we are in. One other thing I would add as well, in terms of New Zealand, it's, it's the, the story of the people, including the indigenous angle. Um, I feel again that that's, that's unique to, to the context here, that's unique to New Zealand, um, and it weaves really the regenerative concept with Maori worldview. There is such a strong, and I, you know, not being Maori, I really don't want to, you know, instruct to develop this too far, but I think there is such a synergy uh, and such a powerful messaging to build around that. Yeah, look, I agree with both of my colleagues on uh, virtually every point you've made here, particularly on the local. I think it does start with local, and I think Alan's absolutely right. And Alina, your question's right. It starts with stories. I mean, he, again, here in the States, uh, local regenerative, even if they're not certified organic, uh, operations are sold out now of beef and lamb and products uh, long before they normally would be. Their freezers are empty. Uh, people want to feel connected and they want to see. I, I, I will say though that data-wise, in terms of consumer data, um, there's uh, one of the challenges we have faced as a market, I know Alan understands this really well, is you know we're so passionate about the good news you know, our organic farms, we have, we have wells in the ground. We know we have no nitrogen runoff on organic farms right next to conventional farms where we have nitrogen runoff. We know that dairy cows, organic cows live twice as long. We know that farmers have um, better incomes. We know that much more carbon is being sequestered. And so we try to tell the poor consumer all of this and we overwhelm them. And so this group that I mentioned before, this organic voices group, and I think there's a model in here for New Zealand, um, uh, what we, uh, we, we spent uh, years pooling consumer insights and came to one 
uh, clear insight that has now been reinforced by a national study that was just done. And that is the number one thing that consumers are motivated by is the absence of chemicals. And in, in, in USDA, under USDA Organic, to be organically certified, and this is true with the three certifiers you have in New Zealand, it means over 700 chemicals are prohibited. And that's our marketing. And you can look at organicvoices.org and see that. So I just want to underscore uh, Chair Sella's point and Alan's to say, my, my, the institute that I run that you're aware of this uh, uh, Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute every November, we don't, we don't, just, we don't, it's not just an organic entry. It's for anybody who wants to try to improve and enhance their storytelling. It, 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 loyalty comes from the heart, not from the head. And, and, uh, but, but if you want statistically to uh, get a grip, it's, it's the absence, it's, the, it's helping to avoid chemical use. Right, thank, thank you everybody. And yeah, following on from, I think, your comments, Chair Saylor, I think we do have just such a, a wonderful taonga in this country of, of the Maori culture and the, and the Maori language. And there's a, there's a comment here from, um, from Anne Salmon. Um, wonderful to have you here, Damien. Um, I like whaiora, uh, seeking well-being, health and prosperity for land and waterways, plants, animals and people. It's simple, it's distinctly Kiwi and based on the ideas in which all forms of life in the world are interconnected. Um, so in a country here in New Zealand where we've been the first to recognize a river as a legal being, uh, why not build on our world leading steps towards those sorts of new ways of thinking? Has anybody got any, any comments in response to that? Uh, I'm on the board of a company called Blue Apron here in the States that does meal kits and all of its beef comes from New Zealand. And, and the story uh, is barely understood here, but what consumers do understand about your pastoral system has given them a serious advantage. Of course, the meat is better, frankly. Uh, I believe that what you just said is, is the key here. I, unfortunately, the domestic market is small. We, don't, we haven't yet talked about the economic dislocation from COVID, certainly over here in the States, we're, we're, I don't know how you would describe what the economy is going to be, but people are going to be stre stressed. And so I think the domestic market for organic will be limited, but I can tell you the New Zealand story is uh, incredibly compelling and beautifully well received here. And social media levels the playing field, right? It democratizes the market. It lets littler folks without big deep pockets uh, do just what Alan just said, show that, show mm -hmm. what's actually happening on the farms. And it's a, I think you have a real advantage here uh, coming into the U.S. market. And as you know, we're trying to help a lot of New Zealand companies come here. Can I, Alina, it's impossible to add something to that because it, it is true. I mean, there's always been this dilemma in terms of New Zealand, the fact that we produce so much food that doesn't get consumed here. Um, the importance of local food economy and local markets and really good food for Kiwis, um, I would say, is, is the fact that this is also, that's how we, we bring a lot of issues, we connect them into a whole when we are seeking solution and it has to do with our own well-being. Um, you know, it is great for a number of years now, we've seen the revenue from our trade, um, um, food export increasing year on year and, you know, this is, we need that. Right, because we've, um, we've got to bring that revenue onto the, to, to the farms, those that produce the food. But the reality is that as a country, as a society, we are still struggling with the fact that we need, you know, we need breakfast for kids, we need uh, school lunches, we need, uh, you know, we still have a lot of people that don't eat good quality food in a country that exports so much. So this idea of local markets, local food economy, and so on, it, it's in a lot of ways also about that it's about equality and it's about social justice and it's about the well-being of New Zealanders. Um, and then, you know, we can talk about that, that trade and the export market. And I think that's also partly where we have the challenges that we have because it's this, how do we balance the fact that we need that revenue that only export market can bring to us while at the same time, we've got to deal with issues here that go beyond farm. We talk about the food system as a whole. Uh, and really our, our, you know, the country system of policies and social policies and so on. 
Yeah, it's very interesting to, to reference the, the perception of New Zealand from international markets um, and leads into a question from uh, Leo. Some say that New Zealand farming is already mostly regenerative and it's, it's very different to other countries such as the US where it's, it's still quite a novel concept and that's something that I've come across a lot in my research. Um, so just, yeah, what, 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 what would you say to that argument, I guess, and interested to hear, um, Alan, have you come across that argument from other farmers and, and what was your response? Uh, yes, we have the answer. For sure, and um, we've also had that argument for organic that we're almost all organic anyway, and it's the same for regenerative. So, look, um, I, I think that the people that are, are trying to drag regenerative down are saying saying these sort of things. Um, the reality is that m much of our conventional farming is no is certainly um, not close to being regenerative, and and we need to uh, yeah we need to highlight that um, the positive things that regenerative farmers are doing um, and, and hope that some of the, the other the farmers around the country will take them up. But um, at, at this stage, um, yeah, I think it'd be a long straw to, to draw that, um, that New Zealand is regenerative. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead, Can Mary. I just, say, just in my world of dairy, I think everybody in New Zealand knows that conventional dairy has uh, been, there's been challenges in terms of runoff and, and, and so on. And, uh, you know, I think the key here is to not make enemies of farmers and to not be divisive, but to be encouraging. And, you know, I love the way Alan talks about this because he, you know, he's saying at 54, I've, I've got 11 years on you, Alan. And, you know, you, but you're saying, you know, you're, you're continuing to learn and you're more excited than ever. And that's, for me, that's what's wonderful about this, whatever the word is, you know, and I li I've lived through the, the diminishment of the word natural, which now means exactly nothing, right? As large companies have come in and, you know, slapped barns and cows on the label and called themselves natural. But what's exciting here is, is, is it's a conversation about principles. It's a conversation about exactly what Chiricella was talking about, which is a an ecological, a systemic way of thinking about farming, and we can all all improve. But what I would say to you all, and you know, I'm an investor in in um, Eat My Lunch, so I, I'm I'm very close to the food insecurity challenges it, it, that Chiricella mentioned, and I couldn't agree more. But you can use the carrot here more than the stick. They where what exports should do if they're if we're successful is put currency put investment back in, which should ideally be able to grow the sort of better for you foods in the domestic market. The key is not to be divisive, right? Not to attack conventional, not to pit organic versus regenerative. The key is to just talk about these as, as uh, ways of improving agriculture in which you know, future generations can live. And I think you're invoking Maori principles here is exactly right. Mm -hmm. All right. There's, um, there's a couple of similar questions come through, I think, which are really interesting to explore from Barbara Hay and Alexa Forms in terms of how do we, how do we get the politicians on board to drive change? So yeah. there's, there's a good groundswell from the farmers. Um, um, Alexa, using the example that changes to water planning in Otago has, has yeah. led to horrendous pushback and argument. Um, so where, how do we think the political in intervention could start? And I know there is an organics um, bill that is going through parliament through select committee at the moment. So that's an interesting place, but how can we get more of the politicians on board? But can I yes, just to, to try and address that? I mean, it, it's such a big, um, it's such a big topic really. And, and it's partly why I was saying that, you know, we've got to be as a movement or as people that we're passionate and believe in the, in the um, value proposition of organic and regenerative, we've got to be a lot more tactical. Where we are in terms of how organic and regenerative is recognized in New Zealand is that really it doesn't have a place in policy at the moment, right? It's not seen. When we're looking at the transformation for the country, um, regenerative agriculture, organic agriculture is not seen as part of a low carbon pathway, for example, right? But as in saying that, 
this is where the policy frameworks are, move, are moving. And so we've got to leverage this. We have, in addition to the organics bill, we've just passed last year the zero carbon bill. And so that, that's putting, is going to put a lot of pressure on agriculture sector as a whole about reducing footprint. Um, and within that, there is an opportunity for all of us passionate about this to actually advocate um, with, you know, and lobby policymakers and decision makers, both at central level, but also regional councils, because we know that they are tasked with looking after natural resources. Um, of, you know, we have to kind of educate them and advocate around the value of organics and regenerative agriculture. We need to make them to recognize the importance in those transition pathways. You know, we have less than 1% of New Zealand's primary land in organic production. Uh, perhaps we can double that or more uh, if we consider very loosely regenerative practices that many other farmers have put in place. This is nowhere near enough, right? It will be great to be able to see, I don't know, a sustainable agriculture strategy for New Zealand that will uh, specifically you know, uh, zoom in on the proposition of regenerative and organic agriculture and have a strategy around it and being resourced properly and, and so on. So it's a whole, it's a whole space that we haven't cracked, you know, but that's where we need to focus in terms of this recognition around the policy value, but also the strategy um, value of regenerative in relation to overall, you know, economic growth and other policy frameworks. I'm sorry if it's not an exact answer. It's no, that's a bit of a that's okay. Answer. That's okay. And I mean, I know, um, I know, it's probably first steps first for New Zealand in terms of um, the organics um, bill coming through Parliament. But I'd love to see in the in the long term some sort of a regenerative organic standard as they've they've put in place in the US to give consumers that guarantee and that level of assurance. It's not law yet, though. It's, it's a it's law. a voluntary standard so far. Right. Got it. All right, we have about six or seven minutes left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna address one or two more questions if I can, quickly here. Um, let's have a look. Um, Gemma has got a question: What are the land use demographics for a regenerative approach in New Zealand across the board? Is there an even spread across meat and and horticulture and dairy? Dairy, of course, being our, um, our our big exporter, but those other ones being of course, very important as well. Ellen, are you able to uh, provide any insight on that? Or? He's muted, Alina. I, Look, there, um, there you go. Yeah, hi, Alina. Look, um, I, I think sheep and beef are certainly leading the regenerative um, platform in New Zealand and um, dairy, there's some very good dairy farmers embracing that now. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite as aligned with the, um, the horticultural side, um, but I, I do know that anything with, with animals, plants and soil works really well. So um, yeah, how, how the horticulture tie that in, I'm not sure. Mm. Yes, that's what I've found in, in a lot of my conversations with people as well. And we, we have talked to some, um, at least one dairy farmer as well, Mark Anderson, who will be featuring on our next episode. Um, I'm going to very quickly cover off one more question and then we'll close up. Um, interesting question here from, um, from Simon Yarrow um, in terms of the future of regenerative agriculture. What is the relationship between technology and regen ag? Is it a conflict of tension or symbiotic? And I'll, and I'll just ask for very quick responses to this one because we've only got a few minutes left. Well, my, I mean, based on our experience here with the thousands of farmers we work with, it's all about um, metrics now. It's all about measurements, giving, uh, there's something called open team and we don't have time to go into it here, but it's an effort to link thousands of farmers together to have a, a, base, a base way of measuring soil carbon improvements and then sharing best practices. It's all open source. Uh, my company has been one of the leader, leaders in getting it going and it's got widespread interest within the conventional and, and organic sector. And as farmers have um, more and more, uh, uh, common metrics, uh, then that will ultimately translate into marketing 
that you know can be able to, for claims that can be meaningful to consumers. So, to me, that's that's a central focus for the next few years. Yeah. Alina, Just, yeah, one go thing ahead, that I like like to add there is that um, as soon as we can get a, a handheld device that will measure nutrient density, I think that's when generative will take off. Yes. I and, I, and I believe uh, I believe that is on the way from some of the conversations I've been having, which is super exciting. Then we won't need a standard. People will be able to tell in the supermarket aisles if, if their food is good quality or not. Um, I think that's a lovely point in which to draw to a close here. Um, wonderful to see so many people interested in this conversation of regenerative agriculture in New Zealand. I think at the height of the call, we had 236 participants, which is just outstanding and shows just how much momentum and excitement there is about this in New Zealand. As I said at the beginning, this is the first of six series. We'll be continuing for the following five Mondays, but we will be alternating between uh, this noon slot and 7 p.m. in the evening um, so that we have um, uh, an opportunity for our participants in the U.S. like Gary to, um, to be part of it. Um, and also, of course, those farmers who right now are out in the field doing what they do. Um, so next week is at 7 o'clock. We are going to be speaking with um, four farmers themselves um, next week. Um, Alan is, of course, a, a farmer as well, but um, next week we're going to be speaking with Hamish Bielski, um, who's predominantly um, uh, sheep and beef, Simon Osborne, predominantly cropping, uh, Mark Anderson is a dairy farmer, and Kay Baxter from the Koanga Institute, who covers horticulture. So that's at seven o'clock next Monday evening. You can find all the details on the Pure Advantage website, pureadvantage.co.nz. Um, on the screen there, you can see uh, the following episodes coming up over the next few weeks as well. And you can learn more on, um, on the, the Pure Advantage website as well about which speakers are part of this. Um, I'm just going to also quickly um, point out that the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, who are a partner in this series, um, have currently got their applications open for Cohort 8. Those close on the 1st of June, so there's a couple of weeks to get um, in those applications to join um, a global network of um, people who are really thinking are at the edge and leading um, entrepreneurs, farmers, um, investors, artists, change makers of all sorts. Um, I believe that there are probably about 11 or 12 hours to get in on the early bird special if you wanted to apply um, today before midnight, otherwise you have until the 1st of June to apply. Um, please um, share these, um, these episodes with your friends. The recordings will be made available. And um, you can also check out details via the Pure Advantage uh, social media channels, the Facebook and um, Instagram pages, and Edmund Hillary Fellowship's Facebook page as well. Um, wonderful. I want to thank again our panelists for joining us today. Um, it's been wonderful to have such a diverse um, series, um, uh, set of uh, voices in the room, really, and, and wonderful to be with you all. So thank you all. Thank you all for joining and we will catch you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.